Hey everyone, George here and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about a fish that I think is an absolutely essential fish for any community tank and that is the Cory catfish, otherwise known as the Cory Dora. This is a fantastic little fish that people know very little about sometimes. They may even have this fish in your tank and you may not know what an absolutely essential fish this is as far as keeping your tank healthy and clean. So when we come back, we're going to talk about the Cory catfish. Hang in there with me and we'll be right back. So as I said in the intro today, we're going to be talking about the Corydora or the Cory catfish. And if you are already keeping these uh, fish in your South American tank or any other tank, actually they're very versatile, so they will work with many, many tanks. But in particular, I like to see these fish in a true South American tank simply because the diversity of that particular environment in a tank is very essential to the health and well-being of these fish. They are South American fish. They are not uh, Asian or Indonesian or uh, coming from Africa or other parts of the world. They are simply and strictly found in South America along the tributaries and, and uh, Amazon region of the world uh, down in South and Central America. So. Like I said in the uh, intro, the reason why I wanted to talk about these fish is because of the huge health benefits that they can offer a community tank. And I don't want to say that lightly because these guys, I think, are an absolute workhorse when it comes to keeping your tank clean. Now, I know that if you're doing everything right as far as water changes and making sure you vacuum your gravel uh, when you're doing... Uh, periodic water changes. You don't have to vacuum your gravel every time, but if you are, uh, you're not going to get all of the food that may be left behind. And that doesn't mean that you're overfeeding your fish. It's just sometimes food gets in places that only these little guys can find it and are willing to go. And I say that because these guys love little places to hide they love to be out in the evening more than they do during the daytime. If you turned on your lights in the middle of the night and went over to your uh, tank, or if you simply went over with a flashlight, for example, at uh, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and looked at your tank, these guys would be all over your tank cleaning up what these other fish have not been able to find as far as food. And that's what makes them such a great little fish for any, uh, like I said, community tank, and specifically, I, as I said, I suggest these guys for South American tanks simply because I'm kind of a purist in that way. But as again, I said, you don't have to limit yourself to a South American tank. You can put them in any community tank. Now, some things that you need to know about these guys is that they can live in temperatures anywhere from um, I would say 78 to 86 degrees and I've even seen them when I've had to raise my temperature up for my discus fish to get them to eat. Maybe they're new di discus fish or something, but these Corydoras even do okay up to 79 degrees. But you got to be careful with this because when you're doing water changes and you're putting your water back in, you want to be very, very close to that exact temperature because they can really have some problems in getting enough oxygen. And that's another thing that I want to talk about. If you are keeping these fish at these higher temperatures, uh, which, like I said, I'm keeping them with discus, I'm keeping them with angel fish that are, are uh, true to the South American uh, native part of the world. And uh, because of that, uh, I am keeping these temperatures a little bit higher and these fish are doing okay, but they're, is a possibility that you can really, really create some problems for them if you're not keeping an airstone in your tank. Uh, you, 
you should really have one of those if you don't have one get yourself one now these are uh, a schooling fish in the sense that they are bottom feeders but they do like to travel around in large groups and the reason for that is is that these guys work together to sort of sift through the sand and gravel in your tank and look for any particles of food that might be left behind after a feeding and uh, they do a fantastic job of absolutely uh, just getting everything you could imagine out of your tank, stuff that you can't even get when you're vacuuming your, your sand and gravel out. Uh, they just seem to find stuff that, uh, that you can't even get. Now that brings me to another point here that I want to make about these fish. These fish are also extremely versatile in the sense that they come in a lot of varieties. In other words, um, I have survey quarries, I have Julie quarries, I have albino quarries, I have uh, pygmy quarries, I have salt and pepper quarries, I have jade quarries. I mean, you can go on and on and on with the varieties that come with this particular species, but they do like to be, like I said, in larger groups. I would recommend, for example, on this tank, which is a 65 gallon, that you keep these fish in a population of no less than 15 to 20 of these guys in a tank that size. Now that seems like a lot, and if you're thinking about one inch per gallon of water, I think that's absolutely ridiculous because of the nature of these fish. These fish are cleanup fish. In other words, they're beneficial to your tank, so you can throw that out the window and not count these particular fish in the sense that they have waste as well, I understand that, but if you're doing your water changes and everything, keeping them in these higher numbers are going to keep them healthier because uh, they just don't like to go solo and they don't like to go in small numbers. So in this tank, for example, in the evening, if I were to, like I said, shine a light in this tank, I would probably find uh, 10 surveys and maybe 15 Julies and uh, probably seven to 10 salt and peppers in this particular tank alone. So I've got almost probably 30 Corydoras in this tank that you would not see during the day because they're in the rocks, they're hanging out in those areas and uh, moving around the tank periodically, but they are constantly, like I said, in the evenings, just really, really moving around. Now, if you have a sand substrate, you can get up in the morning, you can almost see that the, the whole tank has been absolutely groomed by these guys. They have little lines that they leave that's uh, pretty fascinating and, and pretty cool looking on the bottom of your substrate. Uh, if you're using regular substrate, be careful. Be extremely careful not to use anything too big as far as gravel or uh, dirt type substrates because these guys can wear the barbells down that are on the front of their face. They have two barbells that they use to sift through uh, sand and that sort of thing. So I recommend that these fish be used in tanks that have very, very small particle substrates so that you don't damage those those barnacles on the front, or those barbells, I mean not barnacles, but barbells on the front of their face. I have seen this happen with friends who have not been really clued into how these fish uh, really work, and uh, I, it's been a kind of a sad thing because these things do grow back over a period of time, but sometimes the fish can starve to death before uh, they grow back in time to save its life. So. What happens is they wear down and they become too short and they're unable to sift through that sand and get the food that they need. And uh, they're just not real good about running around the tank when you're feeding your fish and grabbing food out of the air. They're strictly bottom feeders and they need to have that, like I said, in this particular tank and most of my tanks, I'm using sand right now, but I do have quarries in other tanks that uh, I don't have sand in and I am using regular uh, substrate um, that is a little heavier and so forth, but I keep some sandy areas in those tanks so that I know 
that uh, these fish are going to be able to have a place to go and find the food that is necessary for them to stay healthy and survive. Now, I don't want to talk about this fish uh, in a sense that uh, they are essential for your tank because lots of different catfish do the same thing. What I like about these guys is that they're small. Most of the time you're going to not find uh, them any larger than two and a half to three inches, but most often you will find them probably right around one and a half to two inches at the most. And uh, this gives you, like I said, an opportunity to put you know, several of these in a tank and not have any problems whatsoever as far as space because they, they stay in that lower part of your tank in that water column that is down below and they just, are, like I said, you'll see them go up to the top every once in a while. I don't know what that behavior is exactly. I do witness it myself every once in a while. But it just seems to be something that they, they like to do occasionally, mirroring themselves or whatever in the, the glass, but it is not a way of, for them to feed. So it's important for you to know that if you do not have enough food for these guys, that they will die uh, in a short period of time. So what I like to do is not only allow them to be a workhorse as far as keeping my tanks clean, but I also like to subsidize their food by putting in uh, some wafer-sized pieces of food in the evening just before I go to bed at night, and that gives these guys uh, who are, like I said, really more active at nighttime. It doesn't mean that they're nocturnal, but they are more active at nighttime, and then they can find that food and uh, and that is kind of a, uh, a substitute for what they're not getting from your regular feeds of your other fish. So it's essential that you make sure that you do have some food available for these fish uh, so that they do have an opportunity to stay healthy. And again, it's essential, it is so essential that you keep these guys in larger groups, as I said, and you keep the substrate as fine in particles as you possibly can because again, these barbells that they have on the front of their face can get worn down and it can really cause these fish a lot of problems. Now, as far as price goes on these guys, they're not cheap in the sense that, um, you know, they're not your $2.99 fish and they're not your $5.99 fish. They're more likely going to be uh, most of these uh, quarries I would suggest to you that if you're looking at $7.99 to $12.99 per fish, that's probably a fair price to pay for them. So it's not an expensive adventure to go out uh, and get these guys and uh, fill your tank up with them. It's not going to be cheap. So uh, if you're going to do this, make sure that you have a, a budget in place to put these in your tank in large groups, as I said, because they just don't do well in small populations. Now, as I said, native to South America, these fish are uh, found all over the place, Brazil, uh, Peru, uh, Colombia, um, Argentina. I mean, you can go all the way down from Central America to South America and you will find these in different tributaries and you will find, like I said, a unbelievable variety. I haven't even touched the surface on the varieties of this particular fish that are out there. And they're finding new species of this fish all the time. New varieties, I should say, of this species all the time. So. Uh, there's going to be a lot of these fish that are going to be on the market. Uh, they, as far as breeding goes, these guys breed fairly easy. If given the opportunity, what I would recommend to you is that you have a lot of uh, rock and uh, places for these guys to hide to lay their eggs because when they get into this breeding process, they like to have a place that's very very dark and sheltered so that they are protective of the eggs and uh, when they give birth uh, to uh, when the eggs hatch I should say uh, these fish are 
going to be somewhat protective of their young, but the, the young are gonna get on their own fairly quickly. Now, I have seen in my tanks uh, with the panda quarry, which is another species that I hadn't mentioned earlier, I have panda quarries and I have seen these guys actually uh, be missing for weeks at a time and then all of a sudden uh, I'll come down in the evening and search the tank wondering you know what's going on with that particular group of fish and I will find a lot of young chasing around with the parents and uh, that's because the parents are being protective and they're making sure that these young fish are not out and about and getting eaten until they know that they're at a proper size where they can be you know on their own and, and doing well by themselves so uh, again uh, not hard to breed uh, if you are looking to breed these fish do your homework on it make sure that you are breeding them in a way uh, that is uh, uh, if, if it's intentional I should say if you're intentionally trying to breed these fish make sure you have at least a 35 to 40 gallon tank like I said put a large group of them in there because it's hard to tell the males and the females apart Generally, as in many fish, the females tend to be slightly larger and a little bit more fat around the back area of their body. And uh, this will tell you uh, more than likely that you have a female in that group. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll probably not be able to tell really easily, but uh, that is one of the things that I've noticed when I'm looking for these fish as far as sexing them. Uh, I look for those particular um, uh, attributes on the fish to see whether or not it's possibly a female or a male. So, well, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. I wanted to talk about these little fish because I think they're such an amazing asset to any tank. And I hope I taught you something about uh, the, uh, the fish itself. A couple of things that I did not mention, and that was... Uh, the types of foods that these guys will eat. Basically, they will eat anything that is in the tank. I mean, from flake to worms to um, pellets. Uh, I mean, every variety of, of food that you can possibly offer these guys. If they can find it in the bottom of the tank, they're going to go ahead and eat it. And as I said, if you want a great cleanup fish, this is the workhorse of all workhorses as far as a cleanup crew goes and I think you're going to be really happy with them and they are a riot to watch because they they're just scurry around the tank in such a way that is pretty it's it's pretty cute really and uh, uh, my grandson likes to come up to the tank a lot of times and, and look at these quarries just moving around the bottom they're his favorite fish I mean these beautiful discus and angels and other fish are in my tanks and he could care less he's just interested in the guys that are yes, might be because he's not very tall but uh, the bottom line is is that he loves to look at these little guys and watch them scurry around and he points at them and and uh, mimics them in a little bit of a, a way and it's it's pretty cute but anyways go out and get yourself some of these fish if you don't already have them if you do already have them and you don't know much about them, now you know a little bit more. And I would, as I said, if you've got a small group of them, go out and get yourself a few more of them because they're not really going to affect the space in your tank. You do have to do your regular maintenance as far as keeping your water changes up and stuff like that because as much as these guys eat, they leave waste around too. Now, something I do wanna dispel is a rumor and a folklore here that these fish eat poop. They do not eat poop. Now, I sometimes will come down in the morning and in the evening I see on some of the white sand or on this uh, sort of tan colored sand here that there are poop from the discus fish laying there and I get up in the morning and it's not there. A lot of times um, People think that when that happens, that the Corydoras are actually eating the poop. They are not doing that. What's happening probably is as they're going through it and sorting through, they're breaking up the poop into particles so that you can't see it. 
which is actually beneficial as well because that gets a chance to, for it to get into the water and get out through uh, your filtration system and uh, filter the water. So uh, again, another benefit to these fish that uh, you might not have thought of. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Leave your comments down below if you have anything to add about these fish or a story you want to tell me about the type of Corydora that you have or quarry cats as they're called. Uh, like I said, leave that information in the uh, comments down below. And I will also be leaving in my description area a little information as to where you can go and read up on these guys a little bit more some of the places that I think are the best place to learn more about this fish and uh, maybe you go there and get some of the information that I haven't really uh, been able to uh, provide you with that uh, is important to you so again thank you for joining me today until the next time we will see you on the next one take care Go out and get yourself some corridors.